so uh, I, to me, obviously, Kesha has been through a dark night of the soul, and it comes through in that song. And, I mean, as I said, the Christian imagery is explicit. She's kneeling in front of a cross and praying. Um, she's climbing that mountain. I looked it up. Uh, uh, the place is called Salvation Mountain, and it's an imperial county in the California desert. And um, it was made by a guy who lives there named Leonard Knight. And he made it out of adobe bricks, discarded tires and windows, automobile parts, and thousands of gallons of paint. And um, if you, it's, it's been kind of named a national landmark. And you saw, what did it say at the top of Salvation Mountain? God is love. So I, I share that with you just as uh, a, the voice of someone who's been through some incredible pain, pain analogous to what we'll read uh, Tamar going through in this story. Um, um, because like I said, we end with Tamar as a desolate woman. And I think there's many people um, that have experienced that emotion. And, and um, so I, I offer that to you as a way to connect emotionally with what is going on in this story. So let's talk about this story. Um, and um, let me say a prayer and we'll begin and we'll, and we'll read. Dear God, help us as we dig into this very difficult story. Um, help us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we had David and Bathsheba, or last time we met, David and Bathsheba, and they, um, the, their son was born, Solomon, and then we had um, David finishing off his war against the Ammonites. And we begin today in 1 Samuel 13 with... Uh, in the course of time, or after a time, so who else, what do you have for verse 1 of chapter 13? Some time passed, yeah, all sort of getting at the same thing. So it seems like a number of years have passed since Solomon's birth, could be a lot of years. Um, and, um, and I'll read this together, or I'll read this um, out loud, you can follow along. Um, I decided to use the NRSV translation today. Um, uh, so if you, if you are reading the ESV and it doesn't match, that's why. Let's read ch chapter 13. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. She was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of Shemaiah, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister, Tamar, to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister, Tamar, to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here into my bedroom so I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. 
Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called, her, he called his personal servant and said, get this woman out of my sight and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing an ornate robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornate robe she was wearing. She put her hands on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. And Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Here ends the lesson. So, what jumps out at you? What struck you about the story? Anybody, is this story new to anyone here? Never read it before? Yeah? Lore. Yeah, yeah definitely not in people's kids' Bibles, uh, for sure. Yeah, this is a dark one. This is, again, why I say there should be an explicit lyrics warning on the Bible, and it should be in a kind of behind the counter at the, um, at the bookstore. So, um, yeah, what, what, uh, what struck you, Gail? What questions? Yeah, that's great. No, I did not read that, and that is a very good observation. So in verse, the last verse I read, verse 22, or sorry, verse 21, I read, when King David heard all this, he was furious. Does yours have, who, so Gail had a sentence at the end that was this, but he would not punish his son Amnon because he loved him. Did anybody else have that verse that Gail has? So this is a good um, thing um, to kind of step out of the deep emotional intensity into some of the stuff about the way we receive the translation of the Bible that we have now. The earliest version of this text is in something um, called the Masoretic text. Uh, that's the Hebrew version. Actually, we, the Dead Sea Scrolls go back even farther. Um, and in those um, earliest versions of the Hebrew text that we have, it does not have the verse that I just read, that Gail read, the verse, or the part of this verse. He would not punish his son Amnon because he loved him, because he was his firstborn. Where you do find that is in something called the Septuagint. Anybody remember? I've talked about it before. Anyone want to venture a definition of the Septuagint? Who feels, who feels bold, courageous? Okay. The Septuagint, if you see it illustrated, it's LXX, the Roman numeral for 70. And the reason it's that is because the legend, so the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. So in um, a few centuries before Jesus was born, in the height of the Roman Empire, many Jewish people had been scattered around the empire and no longer spoke Hebrew. And while Latin was a sort of fancy language, Greek was the common language of most of the Mediterranean basin. And so the, um, the rabbinic community said, we need to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek so that people can continue to read them. And the legend is that 70 rabbis got together and in 70 days translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek and it became known as the, the Septuagint, coming from the Greek word for 70. Um, so, or the Latin word for 70, ultimately, but the, um, if you've ever tried to do a bathroom renovation, it probably took more than 70 days. So the idea that you could translate all these books of the Old Testament, 70, probably not true in terms of the, the, the origin of this text, but that's what it is, the Greek translation. So when these, so the, the Hebrew manuscripts were obviously centuries, um, older, when they translated into Greek, sometimes these scholars would add things like what Gail had, 
in order to clarify something that would have been implied and understood in previous generations, but maybe would have been lost or you could overlook or maybe not guess. So in the original and old text, when King David heard all this, he was furious. He doesn't do anything about it, though. He takes no action. So that's implied that that's David's fault, his mistake, his sin, but it's not made explicit. So the rabbis who translated the Septuagint, the Hebrew into Greek, they made it explicit for their readers. It's almost like a little commentary that they've added to the text. So when you read your English translation of the Hebrew Bible, what the scholars are doing behind the scenes is they're often looking at the Masoretic text, which is a medieval Hebrew text, which used to be our oldest text in Hebrew. They're comparing it also with the Dead Sea Scrolls, which match up almost entirely and are from a thousand years earlier, discovered in the 1940s in a cave in Israel. And they're using the, Mas the Septuagint um, from a few centuries before the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. It's a Greek translation but it gives us the mind of what the Jewish community thought about these texts. And then what is helpful here is it does make very clear that, the, that, the, the, that David, it's, it's good that he's angry, but it would be better if he did something about it. He just holds on to it. So it makes um, kind of explicit what is just implied in some of the other Hebrew versions of this text. What other questions did you have as we read that text? Great question. Are all these siblings from different wives? Yes and no. So Absalom and Tamar are full siblings. Um, Absalom uh, is the, checking my notes, that are the children of David and Makkah. Later on, we're going to see Absalom stage a little rebellion, and he's going to get in trouble, and he's going to flee to Makkah's um, ancestral homeland. Uh, so she was the, Makkah was the daughter of a Gentile king. And so Tamar and, um, and Absalom are the children of the same parents. Um, Amnon is the oldest son of David and Ahinoam, and he is the heir to the throne. He's David's firstborn, but he's the half sibling of. Tamar and, um, and Absalom. But just to, to note, uh, the prohibition against incest in Leviticus, it applies to half-siblings as well as siblings. Lots of half-siblings around, yeah, absolutely. And if you, you know, we get, we'll see, we saw in that story where Tamar says, I'm sure if you just ask David, he would let us be married. Um, the text doesn't say, obviously, what's going on in Tamar's head, but because of the prohibition on incest in, um, uh, in Leviticus, Tamar is probably just saying something to get him to stop. Uh, it's unlikely that David would have allowed Tamar and Amnon to be married, but she's throwing anything at him to try to maybe get him to, to stop what he's doing. Yes, Andy. Yeah, Jonadab, so we find in verse 3, Amnon had this advisor or friend in some translations, Jonadab, who is his cousin. It says he's the son of Shimea, David's brother. This is David's older brother, one of the sons of Jesse. Ruth and Boaz are his grandparents. So um, he shows up and he's the one that hatches this plan to um, allow Amnon access to Tamar. Um, and... Um, what was your question about him? What was his ultimate motive? What was his ultimate motive? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's move, let's, let's, let's dive in. Okay. Um, yes, and you, Francesca. Amnon. Yeah, Amnon is the oldest son of David. So he's alive during the whole David and Bathsheba thing, and he would have been just growing up in court. Yeah, yes, yes, likely. Amnon was likely a, yeah, oh, Amnon's definitely a man. He, he, he may even already be married to someone else. Like there's, there's so many family details that don't always get mentioned because it just sort of sticks to the main point. 
um, like Bathsheba, we don't hear about her other children. There is a chance close to zero that she didn't already have multiple children by Uriah because you don't get married and not have kids in ancient Israel. You get married to start immediately having as many children as possible. So there's always a lot of stuff that's kind of, you know, left out that the, the people at the time would have known, but sometimes we forget. But yes, so Amnon probably is already married. He probably already has children because he's clearly of age. I mean, he's a, he's a, a, a physically mature man and fertile and all that. So he would have likely been already married or at least pledged to someone else if not married. Yeah. Tomorrow, it's, yeah, her age, it's hard to say. C- certainly a maiden. Um, uh, so certainly who is, who's reached sexual maturity but is not yet married, so sometime in that teen years. Uh, for a woman to, in that age to reach 20 and not be married would have been unusual. Not impossible, but unusual. All right, so in the course of time. So some time passes after Dave and Bathsheba. Now, does anyone remember what Nathan prophesied to David in chapter 12, the previous chapter, after he said, you are the man. Well, he said, evil is going to come out of your own house, which is not a sort of, I will curse you forever. It's more of a, this thing is going to have a ripple effect throughout your house for generations. If you don't have something like what happened with David and Bathsheba, and murder, deception, rape, adultery, all of that happened without there, there being a massive impact on your whole family and for David as the king, the country itself. So after some time, Amnon falls in love with Tamar. Now this is not love. This is an obsessive lust. We know it's not love and the writers know it's not love because of the way they describe it. Um, it says she's the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Uh, whenever a physical characteristic is mentioned in the Old Testament, it's important because They almost never mention physical characteristics. They don't describe what people look like. And if they do, they, it's, nobody knows what Methuselah looks like. We don't know what Noah looks like. You know, we don't know what Miriam looks like. It's never mentioned unless it's important. And so here, her physical beauty is important because this is what attracts uh, Amnon to her. Notice it says, um, uh, beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David, um, and, it, uh, and it says Amnon, son of David, Absalom, son of David. It's trying to make very clear early on this connection, uh, and it says he became so obsessed in verse 2, the Hebrew literally is he was narrow for her. He's like squeezed, he's pressed, he's, he can't stop thinking about her, so much so that he is sick. It says she's a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. What that is saying is that they live in different houses. And as a virgin, she would have been protected sort of at all times, and primarily with other women. Um, And so he never really got to see her, maybe except for state functions or something like that. So he can't get close to her. We are, I think, supposed to be thinking also here about uh, David and Bathsheba wanting something forbidden that he can't have and beginning to sort of obsess about it. Um, And here his son is doing the same thing. So Nathan's prophecy is coming true. Um, This obsession that he's sick, wanting her, this whole story, you can read it absolutely as historical events and you can also see it as a parable that shows what happens to human beings when they are obsessed with desire for something that is unholy uh, or um, evil. Or, and this happens all the time. It can happen in little ways and big ways. But this, this I can't get it out of my mind making you sick, there's probably not a single human being that can't relate to that on some level at some point in their lives. Um, and that's happening to him. So much so that his friend, Jonadab, sees him and says, well, you look awful. What's wrong? And he says, well, I'm, uh, I'm in love with Tamar, and she's my sister. So in the, in the Hebrew, uh, the phrase, I'm in love with my brother Absalom's sister, the, it, the, the first um, letter in Hebrew is Aleph. It's like the letter A, kind of, it's a vowel. And um, the words they use here in Hebrew have a big, a lot of them in succession begin with that ah sound. 
And so when you read it out loud in Hebrew, it sounds almost like kind of gasping sighs. I'm in love with my sister Tamar. Like there's, it's kind of conveying through the language this desire. And so Jonadab has a plan. You know, you ask his motive. It's hard to know because it doesn't say. I will say Amnon is in line for the throne. He's the prince of Wales. When he's king, he'll be able to give out favor to lots of people. And I have found it to be true in human experience that when there are powerful people, especially powerful men, but it works for all people, when there are powerful people, there are always folks that gather around them to help them get what they want. Maybe they can justify it, saying, well, it's, I'm not bad, it's their thing, I'm just the, 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 I'm facilitating, I'm the middleman or whatever. I think about Jeffrey Epstein. If you want to listen to it, horrific podcast. You can listen to the one that I listened to about Jeffrey Epstein. He, this was the financier, very wealthy financier, um, successful person who was able to get a whole bunch of people around him to provide him with access to very young women in West Palm Beach, Florida, but other places where he would have his, his assistants, his staff, go to the mall and befriend 14, 15 year old girls, invite them back to his mansion in West Palm and say he needed, you know, special attention. And this would happen also in Manhattan, at his house in New York, and wherever he had places. Um, the number of groundskeepers, the number of um, house cleaners and chefs, the people who drove the cars and flew the planes, so many people could see exactly what was happening. And there are always folks around powerful people who will help them get what they want. Elvis Presley had a special doctor that would write him every prescription he ever wanted. Michael Jackson had a special doctor who would write him every prescription he ever wanted. Um, powerful people will often have enablers around them that help them to get whatever they want. Motivations are probably multiple and varied and overlapping. People like proximity to power and fame. Maybe they think that they'll get some benefit out of that. I have also found that just as for us, who are maybe not powerful and famous, if you have ever obsessed about something that you knew wasn't good for you, I do find that mysteriously there often will appear another human being in my life that will justify that thing to me. Sort of, you know, in cartoons you see the little devil appear on your shoulder, like, it's not so bad. Sometimes it's that, the voice in your head. Sometimes it's an actual person in your life that will absolutely encourage you to do that thing. Um, and Jonadab is that for Amnon. Yeah, Andy. Yeah. So I think about the New Testament the, where Satan very clearly tempts Jesus three times in the desert right after his baptism. And um, it says that, you know, he, three times he responds to the devil with scripture and the devil leaves him. And it says that he left him until an opportune time. We don't hear what those opportune times are, but it's clear that he comes back. And Jesus tells stories of, of exorcisms where if you don't kind of get it right, that they'll come back again. So I think we're absolutely supposed to think that there is, there's, there's kind of evil in the house of David. There's something rotten in, in yeah, the, the personified person of Satan, I think, is, is lurking here around the edges for sure. Yes, Sue. <laughs> yes. What verse are you in? Yeah, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Right, he, that's a, and that's again very intentional. He's distancing himself. He doesn't say, Tamar, my sister. And, and um, Jonadab doesn't correct him. No, actually, she's your sister too. Um, there's, there take, it takes a lot of accomplices often to make sin happen. And you see this going on in this situation. So he tells him uh, a plan. What's the plan? What is Jonadab's scheme? Pretend to be sick. Yep. 
so you're, you'll be sick, and when your dad will come to see you, so when the king comes, say, I would like my sister. So he can't just say on his own, I would like Tamar to come visit me. Right, so he do, yeah, he makes David an unwitting accomplice as well. And the irony is thick because David himself is no stranger to getting accomplices to help him achieve something that he knows is wrong. Yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, we don't know Jonadab's motive. He could be that Machiavellian. Um, we, don't, we don't really know. But he, uh, he says, get, when your dad comes, get him to say, or tell him I, that you want Tamar, your sister, to come and give you something to eat, and that I'd like her to prepare the food in my sight so that I can watch her and eat it from her hand. Um, again, there's some echoes of the, the little you lamb in the story that Nathan told of the, the lamb that he would hold in his bosom and... Um, so the eating from her hand, uh, it's this very tender, loving thing, but it's also in this context, there's some darkness and something ominous, some foreshadowing, because it's a little, it's kind of um, made to be sensual and creepy. Yeah. Um, and so Jonadab helps him to, with this plan. And so Amnon pretends to be sick. The king comes to see him. Again, David, just a loving father in this situation. My son is sick. The heir to the throne is sick. I want to come visit him. And he follows through the plan I'd like. And here he says, my sister Tamar. So here, when it's convenient to him to argue for the connection, I would like my beloved sister to come visit me. He doesn't say Absalom's sister. Now he says my sister. Yes. It's, it's, um, it's clearly not unusual I mean, David seems to have no indication, no suspicion whatsoever that something is wrong. I mean, they are family, and the family bonds are important. So um, uh, we don't have other examples of stories like this to say whether this... But it doesn't strike anybody as a very odd thing. So she then... Um, I'll say also, come and make some special bread in my sight so that I may eat from her hand. Um, the word here for bread bread is also a word for food and it's connected uh, to the word for heart which obviously he's feeling these feelings of love for her in his heart love we can put it in quotes um, but so there's supposed to be a little bit of a connection there that the bread that she wants the love that he feels um, and David then follows through with this asks Tamar and he says go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him so Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon. It's just making sure, hammering it again. We already know it's her brother. We don't need to say it again, but it says it over and over and over so that we kind of pick up on this. Um, and, uh, and she goes. He's lying down. It says she took some dough, kneaded it, and made the bread in his sight and baked it. Now we now know this is not going to be fluffy bread. It's not a loaf of bread because it's given no time to rise. She makes it in his sight, prepares it immediately, and feeds it to him. So it's either like a very flat cracker or, more likely, a dumpling. The reason we think it's a dumpling, think matzo ball soup, something like that, because um, when it says, um, uh, and served him, she took the pan and served him in verse 9. It is a pouring. The word is not served him. It's really she poured it out. Um, so people think it was a dumpling in a soup, something like that. So, uh, which is what you'd want when you're sick. So, um, he refuses to eat. Again, irony, the thing he's really hungry for is her, so she refuses to eat the food. By the way, Kelly, you have a children's Bible? Is this even in there? No, it's not. It is in the Bible. I just have to read it. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, I was curious as I was reading this, what, how it handles that, this story, but, okay, so, uh, he refuses to eat, and he says, get everyone out of here, and everyone left, so this is where the music gets really ominous, and it just, this, the scene turns, so everyone left him, and, you know, again, he's the son of the king, he's the heir to the throne, they're siblings, I guess it's okay, so they all, they all leave. 
And Amnon says, come into my bedroom. So maybe she was in some sort of antechamber or something like that. So I'm going to eat from your hand. So she goes and brings it to him. Um, because, it, you know, maybe he's sort of saying, you know, because he's already ref refused to eat. He, he wants to be with her. She, he wants her to feed it to him, physically close to him. And so this, this is what's happening. Um, and then he grabs her. And very forthrightly, come to bed with me, my sister. He, the fact that he puts my sister in there, like indicates again, like the darkness of his mind, that he doesn't even, as he says those words, he, he doesn't, hear, he's kind of mad with lust. Um, in saying that implies also he knows it's wrong. And she says, no, my brother, indicating this is, you know, we can't do this. You are my brother. Uh, don't force me. It should not be done in Israel. This is where she's kind of alluding to Leviticus 18, where this kind of thing is forbidden. Don't do this wicked thing. And then this very, um, uh, just kind of rips your heart. What about me? Because what's happening, in order to do this, you have to dehumanize another person to justify these actions. You have to see them purely as existing for yourself and for your own pleasure, not a fellow human being who has dignity, who you should respect um, and not use for yourself. So her plea to him, what about me? And where could I get rid of my disgrace? Uh, there are still cultures in this world where um, when a woman is raped, she is seen as um, ruined, cannot be married, uh, so now has lost all of her status, and there are some places where a woman at that point would then be killed. And so she is in a culture like that, and she knows if this happens to me, I will have a stain that cannot ever be washed out. Where can I get rid of my disgrace? Do you see, if you do this to me, do you know what will happen to me? Um, what about me? Again, it's just a, it's so painful to listen to. She would not be able to marry, which is her only path, the social status. She would not be able to have children, her only path, the social status, and that's the role for her as a woman in Israel. Um, and she sees that's not getting anywhere because he just doesn't see her at all as human. So then she says, what about you? You know, you would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel, someone who has um, lost all wisdom, and you're going to be king one day. Do you want to be one of the wicked fools in Israel? And, and then she, her last chance you know talk to the king maybe he'll let you have me um, again she knows that's not right but she's willing to say whatever she can you see someone trapped trying every way she can think of first think about me okay not me okay then think about you and then you know think about your career and think about you know um, maybe maybe there's a way but just not this um, and there's always this sort of this thing in, it, when we hear examples of, of sexual assault today, there's still a lot of people that say, well, what was she wearing? Uh, it's, her, it's her responsibility to stop the predator, the abuser. Um, or why didn't she fight back more? Um, but it makes it so clear. He refused to listen to her, verse 14, and he was stronger than her, so he raped her. And this here is the generational fruit of the David and Bathsheba, men in power taking what they want. And David showing to his sons how to dehumanize and exploit, and now his son is doing the same thing. Amnon, it says then immediately, what's his reaction? He hates her. And this, again, is one of those things um, moving out of kind of the historical narrative into a parable of how the mechanics of sin work in our lives. There is, after you have desired something that you knew was not good for you, and you have then allowed yourself to have that thing, there is often this revulsion. And it says he hated her, but I think it's not um, too much of a stretch to get a little, a little Freudian maybe, a little psychoanalytical here with it and say he's also, there's some self-loathing here. There's that moment after the sin where clarity returns and he can see what he has done. Uh, and um, again, that's, that is a universal experience. So he now hates her more than he loved her and he says just so harshly, get up and get out. Um, 
And um, she says, no, because if you do this, it's even worse. Um, in her situation, in the ancient Near Eastern culture, um, her, Amnon's actions require him to marry her. And even that obviously is problematic because of the prohibition against incest, but that is the only way to save any sort of dignity for her, to quote unquote make an honest woman out of her, to save her from total shame and disgrace. Um, and, uh, but he doesn't do this. So, um, or at least he has to ask to marry her. And then if the father refuses, ask the father to marry her, if the father refuses, then he, maybe he's sort of off the hook. But, um, uh, He's basically ruined her life, and he has some responsibility here for her. It says he refused to listen to her. Again, he's, he's already said in verse 14, he refused to listen to her. In verse 16, but he refused to listen to her. This is a consistent theme here, underlining the dehumanization. He can't even hear the words she's saying. He refused to even hear her. So it says he calls his personal servant, Get this woman out of my sight and bolt the door after her. This woman goes from my sister to this woman. I want Tamar, my sister, using her name to come and I can eat out of her hand, to then my sister come to bed with me. Not saying her name, but my sister, still maybe a little bit human, and then this woman. And in Hebrew, it's even harsher because there is a word for woman. It's not used here. What's used here is the feminine version of the word this. It's like, get this thing out of here. Um, he says he calls his personal servant and said, anybody have, mine, my, this NRSV says, get this woman. Anybody have another word there instead of get? Put. Yeah, the word in Hebrew also could be translated send. Sort of send this woman away. The, and the verb here is used plural. Y'all send this woman away. And then singular, bolt or lock the door after her. So even though he calls one servant, he says, y'all get this. It's almost like a, I, you know, maybe if I say y'all, it doesn't make you as guilty for removing her. It's sort of a collective thing. I'm spreading it around. Uh, but he does say singular. But whenever she's gone, make sure you bolt the door after her. He, I mean... Not even just get her out of here, but make it so that she can't even come back in. And you can think of her weeping and banging on the door saying, let me in, let me in. And I mean, it's, just, it's a horrific scene. But how hard and calloused he's become. Um, so, we now learn that she's wearing this ornate robe. The only other place in the Bible where an or, or, ornate robe is talked about in this way. Anyone have a guess? Old Testament, ornate robe. Joseph. Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. It's the same sort of thing here. Um, did you have a question? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a great question. Like, what's Jonadab's motive? Like, it, it doesn't say. Um, I think. Um, right. Right. But she makes it very public. She has. She's been. She. Yeah. It, it shames him. Right. Yeah, I think um, we're left to guess what her motives might be. I think and it can be more than one thing. You know, it's not just one emotion. There's probably a sense of just, I've been humiliated, and this is the proper response. Um, I don't know that it's a calculated thing. I think she just feels devastated. At the same time, I think there probably is also a desire um, for some kind of justice, absolutely. So I think it's, it's both things. I mean, you, you, again, Kesha and the Me Too movement, like that video is her way of putting ashes on her head and tearing this, I mean, 
Um, uh, she uses some of the, the torn clothing imagery. Um, I don't know that she's a student of the Bible, but it just shows kind of how um, almost primal that kind of symbol is um, when you've been devastated and humiliated. Um, but I think there's, I think for her, for Kesha, and for Tamar, there's probably a sense of wanting some sort of justice to be done. Um, yeah, Andy. Yeah, I mean, this, so to rip one's clothes and put dirt on your head was a way of publicly lamenting or mourning some awful thing, some loss, a death, or your own personal um, kind of shame and, uh, and um, you know, your, your own loss of self, in a sense. So she, this, is, this, is, this is not a weird thing to do. This is a normal thing to do when you have been grieved, shamed, humiliated, something like that. Sackcloth and ashes, um, that sort of thing. Um, and she tears the robe. I mean, um, that robe is a representation of her. You know, she was this beautiful woman, a royal princess, had a life uh, marked out for her that was pretty good, and now it's all been torn to shreds. And so she's making clear physically. Um, you know, there, there's a, a thing in, in Jewish culture to this day where in certain, not all Jews, obviously it's not a monolithic community, but um, where when someone dies, you tear a piece of clothing that you're wearing when you hear the news. And you continue to wear that clothing throughout the period of mourning. Uh, it's the opposite of what happens in a lot of, uh, you know, traditionally waspy culture, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant sort of North American, North European culture, where when you have a hard thing, you're just stoic, the British stiff upper lip, like, no, don't let them see you sweat, don't let them see you cry, that sort of thing. It's the opposite in this culture, very free and open with their emotions and showing it to the world. So ashes on her head, tearing the robe, and she's weeping out loud as she goes this public display of grief. And she is absolutely not covering for Amnon. She will not participate in the cover-up here. So Absalom sees what's going on and says, has that, has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? So he clearly has a sense of what's going on. Um, and he tells her what? What's that? Keep silent. Keep it quiet. Um, and he says, don't take this thing to heart. Anybody have a different translation? It's, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. It says in yours, it's all in the family. Ooh. Um, yeah. Well, anybody have anything else? Don't worry about it. Where are you say that? So you have done prayer, listening prayer with countless women through the years in ministry who have had experiences like this and the family's response is almost always keep it quiet. When it's another member of the family, when it's another member of the family yeah. So, uh, ab so yeah, I think Wanda, your translation is probably getting at that same dynamic. There's a desire to, um, you know, if we can just cover it up and, and move on, don't rock the boat. Um, Well, I, I, is it to rock, the, is it to not rock the boat or is it to protect Tamar? I think Tamar's actions have already made clear what's going on. Um, uh, potentially, potentially. Um, I think sort of like with Bathsheba, it's hard to keep things secret in a royal court. I mean, maybe he, so it's whether, you know, maybe it's not keep quiet, it's, don't keep going on about this, you know, let's, let's let this go. Like a lot of people know about it, but if you, ch if you choose not to file charges, nothing's going to happen, that sort of thing. So people know, people know enough to write the story, um, but he's, it's sort of a, just forget about it. Yeah, do not take this to heart. And so what's interesting to know here, and I'll go ahead and spoil a little bit of what's coming. I read this as Absalom um, trying to, in a clumsy way, console his sister in her grief. And, um, I mean, you've been on the rec receiving end of that when you're really hurting and somebody kind of wants you to make, you make you feel better and they just say like, oh, don't cry, cheer up. 
that's actually really harmful because you're short-circuiting the necessary grieving process. But it's coming from a place of, I'm hurting to see you hurting, and I don't want you to be hurting because I love you, so I'm going to tell you to stop hurting. And so uh, I think that's what's going on with Absalom. We know that he has taken it to heart because he will later murder Amnon in revenge. So he's telling her, don't worry about it. But he clearly knows it's an evil thing, and he's worrying about it. I think he's just trying to console her uh, in an unhelpful way. Um, take it away for, like, I'll deal with this is kind of what he's thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it would be surprising in sort of a modern psychological context for someone who goes through this experience to, it would be normal for, the, for a woman who went through this to lay some blame at the father's feet. I don't think David intended, but David's, but David has kind of um, created this environment within his family. Uh, and it says, again, this, this is just one of the saddest lines in Scripture. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. Anybody know what Absalom's name means? Ab in Scripture means what? Well, yeah, Salam, Shalom, yep. So what does Jesus cry from the cross? Abba. Abba or Ab means father in Semitic languages. So Absalom is peace of the father. Abigail, Abigail is father's joy. Anytime you hear Ab, it's something about father. Um, and so, just again, his name is Father's Peace, even though his father has not brought peace into this world. So she's a desolate woman. And again, we get now to verse 21. When David heard of all this, he was furious. And like we said, the only problem is he doesn't do anything about it. He is complicit as well, in a sense. Um, you know, to, to this, this point we've talked about in a family, the desire to keep it quiet. You know, I'm angry, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Um, and this does happen over and over again when there's abuse in a family. Yes, Sarah? If, yeah, I mean, what would have been the reaction t if there was a punishment? I think um, he has, uh, I mean, death is the punishment. He's broken the Ten Commandments several times. So, yeah. I mean, you see the woman cut in adultery in Jesus' time, and stoning is the is the death there so some form of capital punishment would have been appropriate for his actions um, you could also however say um, that uh, Amnon should have married her uh, there's the story of the and I'm I've, help me Bible scholars the story of the woman who pretends to be a prostitute in order to Rahab? No, well, Rahab was a prostitute. Is that the story where she pretends to be and she tricks the guy and she steals the staff and all that? Yeah, and then she, he has to marry her. So, what? Essentially, yeah, David, yeah, I mean, he had to marry Bathsheba to kind of make it right. So when you have done this to protect the woman, you have to marry the woman so that she has some standing in society. So um, because it's incestuous, though, David could have decided to have him executed. So, uh, but certainly David's choice to do nothing is not one of the valid options um, in the time. It's something that could have been, you know, he could have gone to the prophet Nathan and say, Nathan, what does the Lord say we should do in this situation? And who knows, there could have been some other response. But it certainly would have involved not covering it up, bringing it into the open, and having some sort of consequences for these actions. Um, so... We, the final verse, Absalom never said a word to Amnon. We're learning that there's this code of silence. 
there's a saying in AA, you're only as sick as your secrets. And here there's this code of silence. And many families have a code of silence. We don't discuss these things. And here there's a code of silence, you know, and that nobody had to be taught this. It's just families have their unwritten rules. You learn them without even trying. Um, and here, you know, Absalom saying to Tamar, just keep this quiet. King David hearing about it, being really angry, but keeping it quiet, not doing anything. Absalom himself kind of hatching a plan on his own. Um, even Amnon early on having this lustful obsession with his sister he keeps it in so much so that it gets him sick as opposed to going to therapy now he couldn't have done that but he could have talked to somebody um, to deal with it in some way healthier than what he has done um, and now we end on a bit of a cliffhanger we're going to pick it up next week and see actually i'll be out next week so we'll take a break but then we'll pick back up and we'll see what happens so let me um show you uh that's a that's a renaissance painting of what's going on what you what you there's some there's some food on the ground and it it actually looks like a donut i don't know if you can see that but it's more of this it's like a dumpling um and and he's she's tried to feed it to him from her hand now here's the servant with sort of this smirk is that jonadab who knows but this is an artist's um depiction of this story uh and uh um uh, just wanted to share that. So, main ideas. The neurological pathways of sin and desire. This story is thousands of years old, but every human can relate to having these sorts of um, libidinal urges that you don't want to have but cannot control. So that's going on. We have um, the idea of sin almost always has an accomplice. There are people around that sort of justify or normalize your behavior, help you excuse it. These people just seem to come out of the woodwork. Um, this uh, depiction of in order to sin, one must dehumanize the other to justify your actions. Um, as, as, soon as, um, as soon as you've made the person not a human, you can do almost anything you want to them. Uh, we, and we saw that in the get this woman, you know, that sort of attitude. Um, the generational pattern of sin, that this stuff gets woven into the family and you have to be really intentional to break it. Um, also, the hiding and deception, how that deepens uh, the effect of sin. Like you, you, you end this chapter with a feeling almost of like, there's this vulcan volcanic lava like bubbling under the surface, but because no one wants to talk about it, no one wants to do anything about it, you know it's just going to, when it erupts, it's not a question of if, but when it erupts, it's going to devastate everything. Um, I just, I know of zero family secrets that people actually take to the grave. <laughs> like it, it always comes out somehow. And the hiding and the deception tends to make it, make it worse. So um, there's not really any silver lining to this story other than to say that David and Bathsheba and this whole family are in the family tree of Jesus of Nazareth. Joseph is descended from the house of David. And all of us uh, have family trees with some pretty broken branches in them. Some rot, uh, some blight, and we think maybe God can't work in those places. But when Jesus was incarnate on earth, this was his family. So there's not a part of your story that you have to hide from him or be ashamed of in front of him, but all of it are parts that he can, um, in his wisdom and in his time and in his way, um, bring, bring, bring redemption to. There's not a single part where God cannot bring some measure of healing. Um, and I come back to Kesha's song that she has emerged and you saw the transition just in that artistic vision of that song and that video of how she emerges on the other side of it. So, and it, in that video makes it clear that it is through the love of God. I mean, God is love as she climbs this mountain and kneels in front of the cross. So, uh, that's, um, that's all I would say about this story. What else is on your mind? What's, what, what are you thinking as we, we wrap this up? Yes, one. Yeah. 
Yeah, she says, you've made me stronger than I ever thought I would be. Now, whether that happens to Tamar or not, we don't know. But we would like to think that um, uh, if, it, if, if it didn't happen for her, we know that it has happened for other people. Yeah, for sure. Anything else? Yeah, Kelly. Yeah, there's no, the Bible doesn't sanitize the story and God steps into it. Yeah, Jesus being uh, seen as so different from the Greek gods and the Roman pantheon and all that, many of those gods also were rapists. You know, these powerful kind of Nietzschean characters, um, operatic characters, whereas Jesus steps humbly into this broken family and, um, and seeks to bring redemption. So well, let's end on that, and we'll see you not next week, but the week after that. So let me close with a word of prayer. Um, dear God, thank you that you step into our families and um, we ask that you bring redemption and healing where we need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.